date of consent plenary um, for the NCSF Consent Summit. Um, we have a great crowd here, and we also have um, over 50 people had RSVP to view it online as well. So we're really happy to have so many people interested in talking about consent. Um, the online people may not be able to see the um, PowerPoint because it's a little bit blown out, but it's just to give you something else to look at other than me when <laughs> I'm talking. So it's really not critical. Um, NCSF decided to hold our consent summit um, where we wanted to bring people together across cultural lines. We didn't want to just focus on our own community because we wanted to build our understanding of consent. Um, and we wanted to understand better how to prevent sexual violence. So we created this consent summit with the idea of networking in mind, um, as well as producing this educational summit. So I want to thank Kitty Stryker. Who's Kitty? Hello. Yay, who's Kitty? <laughs> Um, on our consent activism panel later, and as you know, she knows a lot about consent activism and consent culture. But we were talking um, about an NCSF fact that we were working on um, about consent violations, and she suggested that we hold a consent summit. Um, and so NCSF took that back, and we've been in discussions about it ever since, and we eventually did create this giant consent summit. So um, thank you so much, Kitty, for suggesting it. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on consent. I've been dealing with this a long time. But like most of you, I actually just <coughs> work on projects and programs um, to help educate people about consent and help educate people about sexual violence. Um, I started as an activist 25 years ago when I got into the SM community. And almost immediately, I was discriminated against. Um, I had a erotic publisher invite me to a dinner to talk about what I thought was my book that I proposed. But instead, we get there, and we're having dinner, and he's, he starts talking about this couple that I was in a triad with. And he happened to know this couple. And he said, well, since you're dating them, you can date me. And I was like, no, I don't think so. And, and he said, well, what do you think this is? You know, like by me coming to dinner with him. And I was like, well, I thought we were talking about my book. And I walked out. And at that point, and I think I walked out because it was just so egregious. I mean, it was just so in your face. It wasn't nothing subtle about it whatsoever. And, um, and I decided then that I was just not going to stand for that. I mean, it was just too much. I decided I was going to be out so everybody would know who and what I was, use my real name. I didn't care. I wasn't going to be put in that position again. And I have to, you know, I've lost contracts that way uh, in my career. Um, I, people, Some people don't want to work with me because I'm an activist and um, I'm kinky, but um, a lot of mainstream publishers did take a chance on me and they really supported me and they linked to my, my website that has a link to NCSF and says I'm the spokesperson for NCSF. So, but looking back on all that time and seeing the history, um, I think that Western culture is at a historical crossroads right now when it comes to sexual violence and consent. And I'm really curious to hear what everybody else thinks too. Um, Lately, we've been just seeing so much education about consent in grassroots um, projects as well as the well-funded government um, programs and colleges on affirmative consent. Um, and we've also seen um, you know, a lot of money going to the well-developed um, networks of victim service organizations, um, and they're putting out a lot of programs. And we at NCSF know that you cannot have sexual freedom without a, an empowered population. Um, we've never advocated for people to do anything they want to do anytime they want to do it. We advocate for informed consent. So everybody's on the same page. Everybody agrees to what they're doing. Um, we advocate for a world where inequalities are abolished, um, so people aren't coerced or manipulated into consent um, or discriminated against. Um, that's why NCSF has these dual objectives. Um, we take a very strong position that sexual conduct has to be mutually pleasurable and fulfilling, therefore it has to be consensual. And when it's not consensual, it's not about sexual freedom anymore. It's about abuse and dealing with sexual violence. And that leads directly to our other fundamental objective, which is convincing uh, legislators, prosecutors, judges, um, and society as a whole, really, that intimate sexual conduct is not to be considered um, 
something to be prosecuted or condemned, as long as it's truly consensual. So when you hear, as you will during the summit, uh, that NCSF is fighting to decriminalize BDSM, as well as polyamory and sex work, you have to realize that the freedoms that we're promoting um, depend fundamentally on consent. And that's why we need to think about and really understand the complexities of consent. Um, at this summit, you'll hear discussions about consent in all different kinds of communities and all different kinds of forms. And we hope to take that information and inform our own understanding of what consent is. And so we're holding this plenary and we're bringing everybody together because, again, we want to be on the same page. Um, we want to talk about the high points, the historical high points, so we all kind of have an understanding. And we also want to remind you of things that aren't mentioned in this plenary because we want the rest of the day to be very interactive you know, to have questions um, in the plenaries, we really encourage you to ask questions and make comments um, so that we can hear from a lot of people, not just the people we've brought in to discuss consent. But by necessity of time, I mean, I could have done the whole world, but I'm focusing on Western culture and predominantly North America. And that's just for time. If you guys gave me three hours, I'd be up here talking about <coughs> three hours. <laughs> I don't have a remote, so he's okay. gonna be my he's gonna be my remote. <laughs> so first, I want to start with the ground that we um, are standing on, and I think this perfectly illustrates what consent is and what it isn't um, outside of a sexual um, context. So you may know that Seattle was named for Chief Seattle of the Suquamish Indians, and those the, this tribe has been on the Puget Sound for ten thousand years, and there's still a thousand members of this tribe in Fort Madison Indian Reservation. Now, Chief Seattle, you may not know, I mean, you may know since most people are from Seattle here, they, um, he actually got the title of Chief because he fought off an incursion by another tribe. And he became Chief of the Suquamish. But when the U.S. government came in, he realized, uh, you know, we can't overcome this military might. And so he actually kind of negotiated and bargained. Um, and, um, and, you know, eventually signed the Treaty of Fort Elliott in 1850 giving up the right to roam the sound. So did Chief Seattle really <coughs> consent in that case? It was under duress. Um, it was under unequal circumstances and terms. He already knew he couldn't fight the win. So what we call that is coerced assent. It's agreement, but it's coerced. Um, and the land was taken by force because even if the Suquamish didn't fight, other Indian tribes in the area did fight. And then even once they were overcome, they were subjected to assimilationist programs for generations um, that further violated the people and, and took their culture away from them. So during this consent summit, I bring this up because, you know, how can we remember other cultures and customs when we talk about consent? We're so stuck in our own boxes, it's hard sometimes to come out from that. And we especially need to honor the cultures that have been displaced by violence, like the Suquamish. Okay, Cal. So it comes down to the fact that we're all taught that our bodies aren't our own. And one of our presenters, presenters on the Affirmative Consent Panel, Ruby B. Johnson, who came all the way from Texas to be with us, um, yeah, suggested that I read uh, Between the World and Me. If you haven't read that book, it's amazing. It's um, by Tony Hasi Coates. And he talks about growing up as an African American in Baltimore and how he knew his body wasn't his own. And how he could be touched and hurt by people in the street and even by his own family as his family tried to teach him about the harshness of the world. Um, and so he wrote this book to his own son after he saw his own son touched and pushed aside by somebody. And he realized his own son was going to be facing these same things. And so he speaks to his child about this culture of violence that he lives in. Um, and it's something that his particular situation, that most of us can't even really understand um, growing up in that kind of a culture of violence. But I think even in more privileged circumstances, our children are taught to accept um, all sorts of boundary crossing, all sorts of violations. One of our workshop presenters for Train the Trainers, Jim Duvall, who you all know, maybe you've heard his story before, but I love it. <laughs> he said he would just tickle his daughter, tickle her, and he realized, I'm just teaching her that a big man can swoop down and grab you and do whatever he wants to and you can't do anything about it. So he actually long ago started asking her, can I tickle you? 
And sometimes she says yes, and sometimes she says no, and sometimes he's tickling her and she's like, no, and so he stops. And I think that's a wonderful thing that we should be doing with all of our kids. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's following, there's a whole discussion going on online yeah. like, <laughs> with so many people. So we've been conditioned by children's stories and fairy tales like Sleeping Beauty. Um, and sure the symbol is a misogynist ideal of a man saving a woman. But I think even more, it's these kinds of cartoons, it shows a man kissing an unconscious woman to bring her to life. And this is perfectly acceptable. We've all been raised with this. It's only until recently that um, we got in Frozen, where the prince asked, can, can I kiss you? And some people were making fun of that. And we're like, are you kidding me? Do we want this or do we want can I kiss you in Frozen? I think we want can I kiss you. Because I know I was conditioned this way when I came into the community. I was an active member of NLA Metro New York. I was an active member of the Oil and Society. And I heard same, same, and consensual every week that I went. And I got all these educational classes, and I would have told you I knew exactly what same, same, and consensual was. But <laughs> it took a bad scene for me to realize I didn't, I didn't really understand this. Um, it was with a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, actually. She joined in, um, and she was doing something that hurt me. And instead of me saying something, I just kept looking at my master and going, oh, you do something in my mind, right? Um, and afterwards, I asked him, why didn't you stop her? You knew I didn't like that. And he said that, um, uh, that uh, it was up to me to decide what I do with my body. Um, that my body's my own and I have to take control to handle it. Um, so I think that's why most people in mainstream society are afraid when they hear about like prostitution being criminalized, or sex work, getting, they're fearful of what that means. They think of um, you know crime overrunning their streets and drugs, and women in particular being coerced into sex work if it was um, decriminalized. But I think at the heart of it, I think we're just really, everybody's sexually controlled by our government. And I think we're fearful of having those se sexual controls taken away. Um, you know, that's why sexual freedom is so threatened to government, um, because they continue to create these useless laws to control our sexuality. Because ultimate freedom is frightening, and we all know that. Um, I think any kingster, swinger, polyamorous, we know. Uh, how, how frightening freedom can be. But the empowerment when you're taught how to set your own limits and how to set your own course, and draw your own lines, um, more than makes up for that risk. Uh, we should be able to do whatever we want with our bodies, uh, whether it's sell it or sculpt it, you know, or change its gender, um, have sex with whoever we want, however we want, as long as we're all informed, consenting adults. Um, so my generation was raised to accept these kinds of casual violations. Um, and I think the millennial and the Gen X was also raised that way, unfortunately. But they're having to change because they're raising kids of their own now and the millennials are not having it. And it's coming slowly. It's change is not happening instantly. We, we're actually really feeling our way to find out how to talk about this in this new way in terms of consent instead of sex and what goes into what, <laughs> and what gets moisty and what doesn't. OK, the next one. <laughs> so consent in the law is one thing we're going to talk about today. And the reason we're going to talk about consent in the law um, on our panel with four amazing attorneys, you're going to love this panel, right after the keynote speech. Um, but we have to talk about consent in the law because the way that we treat consent is ingrained in our laws. Um, and governments have sanctioned inter intimate partner violence since the beginning of recorded history. Um, you may know this is the rule of thumb. This goes back to Romulus, the first ruler um, of Rome. Actually, he killed his brother Remus. But um, it was decided that the base of the thumb is the proper width of a rod to beat your wife. And this rule of thumb actually changed. It was enforced for millennial because it changed to like a finger's width through time. And that was considered, okay, we're getting moderate because it's only a finger's width, uh, the rod that you're beating your wife. So to put it into historical perspective, from that time um, till a decade after the Civil War, 
is when the finger switch rule was finally overturned by the North Carolina Supreme Court. And the North Carolina Supreme Court said, quote, the husband has no right to chastise his wife under any circumstances. We're all like, yay! But then the court added, quote, if no permanent injury has been inflicted, nor malice, nor dangerous violence shown by the husband, it's better to draw the curtain, shut out the public gaze, leave the parties to forget and forgive. So they criminalized it, but then they didn't. Basically said, as long as somebody's not beaten to death, you can still do it. So eight years later, um, Maryland became the first state to pass a law that made white beating a crime. And ironically enough, it was punishable by 40 lashes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that shows you they didn't get it, right? <laughs> um, so, but in order to get these new laws passed, um, suffragettes fought for the vote so that they could gain equality with men in order to get these new laws. Yeah? Uh, even as white beating gradually became considered a crime, there was a movement to move these crimes out of criminal court and into family courts. And what these family courts did was they weren't so interested in punishing the wife beater. They were interested in reconciliation. It was government state sanctioned forcing a beater and his wife, which is typically what it was at the time, very gendered, together into a room, and they made them reconcile. Um, so this meant no punishment for the person who's doing the beating, and it meant that women didn't report abuse, because why would you do that? Um, you know, if it's bad enough already, you certainly don't want to have everybody in your business telling you, you know, you need to stop this. Um, you need to stop complaining, which is basically what it came down to. Okay, so the next one. So when I hear people say, great culture, um, what I hear them say is that there's a culture of violence that we're living in that we just don't even think about the fact that our government has, um, you know, sanctioned intimate partner violence for so long. The, the other point in the law is, it's called the marital rape exception. Now this started back in the 1500s, where it was decided that a husband cannot be guilty of a rape um, committed by himself upon his lawful wife. And they said it's because by their mutual matrimonial consent, a contract with wife hath given herself in this kind unto her husband, which she cannot retract. Now this was in force until 1993. Okay? We're not talking about ancient history here. We're talking about a cultural violence that's just been sanctioned by the government. And even today, there's eight states that have different marital rape statutes than criminal rape statutes. NCSF got a call from somebody um, with our incident reporting response looking for help because in her state, Ohio, you it's not in the statute that you can't legally, you can't drug and sexually assault your wife. And she said she was waking up with marks on her arm and she was wondering if she was being drugged and having something happen to her. Today, last year. So this, this is why people talk about rape culture and get so upset about that. Because it's this stuff that is carried through. Um, rape culture refers to these traditions, these customs that excuse sexual violence. Um, we see it in popular culture, we see it in the media. Yeah? Yeah, one. <coughs> Part two. So there's like several different things that when you hear somebody doing, you can point to and go, this is rape culture. Well, we got to sit back, though. <laughs> no, we got to go There we go. It's the cartoon. Everybody was reading the cartoon. <laughs> and I, I'm trying not to put really horrible things up on the screen. I'm trying to put something that's like commenting on rape culture. Um, so it's one of them is victim blame. And one of these things is, the, you know, the way that somebody's dressed is blamed for the violence. Um, whether it's a short skirt or it's a leather jacket, um, it's blamed for the violence. Victim blaming is also saying things like, well, if it happened, you were raped, 
why didn't you report it to the police? Um, another part of rape culture is trivializing the experience. Um, and that's basically calling somebody's reaction drama, um, or saying that they're too sensitive, um, or saying that you have no sense of humor. Um, and I think a perfect example of this that we can all get behind is um, Republican presidential candidate John Kasich said something really stupid about gay discrimination. <coughs> he said, quote, if you feel as though somebody is doing something wrong against you, you can just for a second get over it, you know, because this thing will settle down. Okay? That's trivializing the experience. So that's telling somebody that their experience that's harmful is something you should just get over. Um, another thing is objectifying behavior. And we see this a lot by you know, judging somebody's worth by how they look, um, judging who they are by how they look, rather than the things that they accomplish. Um, and also seeing people for only what they can do for you, having that kind of mindset. Um, and that comes from things like pressuring somebody when they don't want to have sex by saying that you're being cold or approved or a bad submissive, um, is objectifying behavior, trying to place somebody in a, in a label that you have. Um, and then a fourth thing that's kind of a little more insidious when it comes to this is playing defense. Um, for decades, all we did was taught women how to avoid rape, how to not wear your hair in a ponytail. I heard that for years. I wore my hair in a ponytail because of that because I thought that is crazy that they're telling me not to wear my hair in a ponytail just because some guy's going to come along and grab my hair. Um, so you can't just teach self-defense instead of also teaching, you know, um, how to not harass, how to stop people when you see harassment, how to intervene if you see sexual violence happening, <coughs> you know, how to, how to get consent from somebody, what kind of questions to ask, the more positive, proactive things instead of saying, okay, don't wear a short skirt and don't wear your hair in a ponytail. That's great culture talking. Okay, Cal. So this is a horrible t-shirt. Um, it's an eat, sleep, rape, repeat t-shirt at Coachella. So when people talk about rape culture, they're talking about things like this, and a lot of it is um, commercialized. This was just last year. So somebody had to make this t-shirt. Uh, whether he did it, some company had to produce it. Um, and the, the blue one is even worse. That was actually put out by a company. It's called um, Solid Gold Bomb, in case you want to avoid them. <laughs> um, it's Keep Calm and Hitter, and it's also, which, Okay, we can kind of, as long as it's consensual, but then the other one they have is keep calm and rape a lot. Which I thought was just terrific, I didn't even want to put it up here. So, um, I think that this brings up all of these facts. What we have to think of today is how are we supposed to go into sexual encounters, you know, with equality, when inevitably there's power differences that exist between us because of the way our society is. Um, we have to keep aware of these. Okay, the next one brings us to feminism. Now, as you know, if you haven't had a women's intensive women's studies class, I'm just going to go over a little bit, just a touch here, but um, it was women that challenged this cultural norm in the 1960s really successfully. And their mantra <coughs> was, we will not be beaten. They were actually going out there in streets with placards, we will not be beaten to raise awareness about this. Um, and one of the earliest um, shelters I could find opened up in 1967 in Maine. 1967, that was after I was born. Um, others followed in Canada, Great Britain, uh, parts of Western Europe and Australia. There was a real wave that hit, and that's why they called it second wave feminism. Um, it was about uh, <coughs> women's rights and women's liberation. And that's where the mantra, the personal is political, came in which we should all embrace, because that means what we do in our homes and in our private lives is political. We have to look to what we're doing privately because that reflects the greater society. It's not just something we can go away in a little, little room and forget about everything. So this did create a revolution in support services. Um, now ended up organizing 300 local and state rape task forces um, in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, by 1972, there was 400 independent rape crisis centers for women that provided support groups and counseling. That's in just five years. Um, 
And then by 1978, the National Co Coalition Against Domestic Violence was created with the goal to gain financial aid for shelters and grassroots services and share information and share resources on research. They were really starting from ground zero. Okay, so the next one. I went to my first NOW meeting in my late teens, and it was right around the 1980 delineation of lesbian rights. If you don't know what that is, the delineation of lesbian rights. I love this quote, by the way. This is actually a modern quote, even though we're talking about the past. Um, but the delineation of lesbian rights was created as a way to accept certain lesbians in the NOW. Right? <laughs> Certain lesbians were okay and others weren't. And so they had this list of lesbians that weren't okay. And um, one of those things was pedastry, which actually, pedastry means men having sex with boys. But this was in the now delineation of lesbian rights. Um, so basically they didn't want pedophilia. They didn't want anybody who was associated with that. Uh, they didn't want anybody who supported pornography. And they didn't want anybody who was involved in sadomasochism. Um, so, I, as a budding bisexual submissive, <laughs> didn't really know much about what was going on with the feminist force, but I did know about um, Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon, and, and their voices were out there louder than the voices that sounded like mine. Um, they drowned out me, and I was really upset about it. I remember going to now groups and talking about, like, you know, uh, you know, what about exploring sex? I was out there really exploring and, you know, trying all different kinds of things, you know, very self-determined. And I thought that that's the way you empower people, and I kept getting talked down. Um, and it's because Catherine McKinnon, um, in particular, said about consent, which I thought was interesting. Consent as a concept was never designed to apply between two people in civil society. Um, it exists to rationalize the exercise of dominant power by the state over its subordinates, the government. That's what consent is for. Applied to sex, he is the government and she is the governed. So I was hearing this, and like you, I'm just like, huh? Oh, first of all, what about she and she? <laughs> you know, what about he and he? What, what is this, right? So this kind of extremism is really good for getting a message out, especially when you're creating, you're kind of bashing through a wall of cultural resistance. It's, you know, you've got to get your voice heard. Um, and that's what it did. But then once other voices start joining in, the extremists are not getting the results done. It's people in the background who's actually setting up the shelters and getting things done. Um, but because the purpose of extremism is to attract attention, you sometimes get people who like attention who continues to be voracious critics of your own movement. They tend to turn around and they're the loud voices against what you're trying to accomplish because that's how they can hold the, the uh, attention. But this kind of rhetoric is really dangerous because what we saw back with now in the 1980s, that rhetoric that we're gonna cut out sadomasochists, you guys are enforcing the patriarchal society, that was used as justification to um, attack women who were into leather, especially at like the Mis Michigan Women's Music Festival. Um, women were attacking leather women who were walking down the paths in their leather jackets. Um, and, and as they were attacking them, they were saying, you know, you're into SM. You're enforcing the patriarchal stereotypes. You're violent. You're committing violence against women. That's why you're <laughs> <laughs> So the, the hypocrisy of that stunned me. <laughs> I actually still have my female trouble survey from 1994, and that was the same year that the Violence Against Women Act was enacted, 1994. But in this female trouble survey, over 500 women were surveyed. Over half of them said that they had been a victim of violence by another woman because they were into SM. So that's why I actually started the Now SM Policy Reform Project. When I got that survey, I saw what was happening. A member of Now, um, I said, well, this needs to change. So we started a three and a half year program going around the country explaining what BDSM is and explaining why it's, it's based in consent um, and explaining why this is not <coughs> against women. And finally in 1999 at the Now National Convention, 
we got a new delineation of lesbian rights passed to overturn the old one. <laughs> and it embraced the expression, the diversity of expression among women. It was very vague. <laughs> but at least the, the bad one was gone. Um, and that was our goal. So this brings us to gendering. When we're talking about all of this, it, it, so often it comes up men, women. And I can tell you from personal experience, anyone can be violent, and they are. Um, anyone can be a victim. Anybody can be violated. Anybody can be a survivor. Um, we come in all different colors and orientations and genders. So our cultural violence definitely does affect men, and it absolutely does uh, affect the gender variant. So we can't just keep this a binary men-women discussion. Um, because that ensures that we don't accurately know what's happening if we continue to just talk about men versus women. So the next one, um, the, the great place to get stats, if you're ever looking for stats, is the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. And I gave the, the mural here for the stats I'm going to give in case you want to check it. Um, and so when you look on the face of it, you might think that it supports this kind of gendering. Um, when it says one in five women and one in 71 men um, will at some point in their lives be raped. That's what the stats say. The stats also say that twice as many men, one in 45, will be forced to penetrate someone in their lifetime. And so when it breaks down, it's like basically 91% women, 9% men. So that doesn't tell us the whole story, though. Coming from NCSF, we look at things a little bit different than just binary men and women. Um, so the next slide, when you look at it by orientation, it might be hard to see, but this is the women's side going back. Ooh, it went back. It went back sometimes. There you go. This is the women and that's the men. Again, we're binary because this is the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. It should actually include trans. But um, when you look at it, the women, 46, 43% of heterosexual women reported sexual violence other than rape in their lives. And when you look at the back there, bisexual men, 47% of bisexual men report sexual violence at some time in their lives. So when, when you, we see this in NCSF too, we actually have <coughs> sexual, and then we have pansexual on the outside, or no labels beyond that, and we find the violence goes up. The more we are um, experimenting, the more that we're open, open to um, not just a binary universe. It may be because that makes us targets, and it's just part and parcel of discrimination that, that this is happening. It could be because we're experimenting more, we're putting ourselves out there maybe more, um, or having more sexual encounters, who knows? But I think that this is a more accurate portrayal especially for all of us, because um, we look at this and see, yes, violence is happening among all different kinds of people. It's not just men versus women. And it's not just a, we have to teach men not to rape and women how not to be raped. Because it's NCSF, we get perps that are women, we get perps that are men. It's, we get people that are being accused uh, that are men. We get people who are accused that are women. We help everybody. Uh, and trans. Um, and um, that's the most difficult part is when you're trying to help somebody who's trans because you want to make sure that they're respected, which is the YWCA, yay. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource um, for connecting people with um, victim, victim advocacy services. So the one last stat from this um, that I want to talk about is four out of five cases of rape. Um, the, the person who was raped knew the person who did it. So we're not talking about strange danger here. We're talking about somebody that you know. Um, and statistically, rape costs more than any other crime. It's $127 billion a year is what rape costs our country. Uh, murder is $71 billion. You can murder somebody that's less of a cost to the, the country. And drunk driving is $61 billion. So you look at the drunk driving campaigns that have been going on for decades, you know, PSAs on TV, we should be having those. We should be having consent, PSAs, something positive. Set your boundaries, enforce your boundaries, 
let somebody know when somebody's transgressed your boundaries. You know, just some simple PSA messages that don't have to get graphic. We need those. So, the upshot of this is, I think that we have to stay gender, gender neutral when we're talking about consent and sexual violence um, and orientation neutral. So the fact is that we can't solve the problem by gendering it, but we do have to talk about gender when we talk about historically sexual violence because that has an impact today, carries over today. So we have to balance these two. We have to inform everyone, but we can't demonize. So when we look at how this history that we've been talking about comes out, there's a few things that we want to consider. Um, just to challenge our own you know, preconceptions. Like when it comes to sex. Even now girls, um, if girls like sex, they're slut shamed. If they don't like sex, um, they're often considered prudes or pressured into having sex. Okay. Here's one point, a bit of minor. But then think about oral sex. Oral sex. Men get a lot of oral sex. At least you hope so, right? <laughs> <laughs> women, not so much. Especially in the dating scene. Just not so much. You just don't see women. There's, I can find a single culture that, that somebody going down on a woman was as prevalent as women going down on men. Um, in some cultures, it's completely forbidden. I mean, just men wouldn't even think of it. Peggy Ornstein talks about this in Girls and Sex, a great book. How it seems <coughs> normal. Of course men get blowjobs and women don't. And whatever justification you're thinking in your mind of like why men get blowjobs, it really isn't. Because if you if if a man is asking a woman to get him a glass of water, just give me a glass of water, get me a glass of water, get me a glass of water. And eventually she's like, well, you know, I like a glass of water. <laughs> and um, and it's done begrudgingly or it's not done at all. That kind of shows up the hypocrisy in this whole thing, different than just looking at it in oral sex. It kind of shows you where we're kind of trapped in our own minds about what we think is <coughs> normal and acceptable. And we have to challenge those because we're trying to get out of that mindset to create a new paradigm here. So that's why sometimes it feels like it's relentlessly negative when we talk about this, because it's a negative subject, it's sexual violence. And it's hard to engage people when you're talking about a negative um, subject. <coughs> but we have to call out the ways that we see um, sexual violence happening. Yeah? Love this. Um, this is my wonderful Mr. Darcy cartoon, because he, he was the original negger. <laughs> 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 right? And that's what pickup scene and negging is, is it's being negative about a woman's appearance or her um, <coughs> actions, just to put her on the defensive, to, to get power over. Um, so it's a coercive manipulation, and it's something that people are talking about and very proud of, uh, which is kind of crazy. But it's based on the idea that women are giving something in sex and men are getting something. And so you have to try to like get what you can out of somebody. Um, there's also, we see, this negativity come up, even in very liberal settings, like the fashion industry. Um, famed photographer Cherry Richardson, who I loved at one point, but he's been accused of using his influence to force models into sexual behavior and sexual poses, and I think sometimes now I look at his images and I go, oh, what am I seeing? Am I really seeing, like, you know, violation in, in action, in vogue, you know? It's not, not pretty. Um, and he's being supported by a lot of, um, people in the industry, and is continuing to be very popular. We also see it with in institutions like reports of sexual assault in the military more and more, and of course, the priest scandal, which now is kind of turning into a scandal over cardinals who are protecting the priests who are committing the abuse. So as we, as we continue to push this, we kind of go up the food chain um, and, and are more effective. And unfortunately, even in the adult entertainment industry, um, we see this James Dean. I don't know if you saw this on online, but he's a really super popular adult actor because he looks like the guy next door, and, and he 
apparently is kind of sweet sometimes. So lean down and whisper in the girl's ear. It looked very intimate. So there was a he had quite a following among women, especially really young women. But he's been accused of um, sex, sexual violations by nine different women. Um, and some of this happened at kink.com when they put everybody in barracks and they were all showering together in the same place. And kink.com has since realized this is not a great idea to keep the keep the keep the words you go in 24/7. Things get out of hand. Um, <laughs> and which is great. Kink.com is wonderful when it comes to trying things and fixing things. Like they were one of the first that came out in terms of showing a negotiation. It was like such a simple thing, right? Now I want them to go further. I want them to really show the negotiation. I want them to really show the discussion afterwards and say, oh, that's okay, that's great. I, I kind of push myself. Why not take five minutes, two and a half at the beginning, two and a half at the end, to really have a discussion? Well, I like this, but this was a little too heavy, and this made me uncomfortable. I've decided I'm not going to do this anymore. I would love to see kink.com push further, in, including the education since they have the kink U. Um, and I think we can all encourage that with them. Um, I'm committed to that. So <laughs> the next thing, Cal? That's my husband, Kelly, by the way. <laughs> um, so you can point to all of these things that I just talked about and say men versus women, right? But it's not. The gendering is creating a lot of backlash. Um, this man, George Lawler, is 19 years old. He's a Warwick University student. And he made headlines with this image. It says, can you see it? This is not what a rapist looks like. Okay? Um, and he did this whole thing after um, he was called to um, participate in um, a consent, I heart consent um, workshop. And he was offended. He's like, I don't need this kind of education. And he wrote this, and this is not what a rapist looks like. I think this is really interesting because when you look at this without the backstory, you can like, wow, what the heck is he talking about? Is he making a comment on race? Is he making a comment on um, class? Since he clearly he's, you know, upper middle class. Um, and, and to find out, no, he's making a comment because he's feeling like the gendering is getting to him. But then also, it's terribly ironic because we just found from the, the stats, unfortunately, four out of five people are raped by somebody they know. It could just be somebody who, who looks like this, who is your friend and seems perfectly ordinary. So ironically enough, his, his point that he was trying to make, I think, <coughs> So the next one. So this points to the fact that consent <coughs> education doesn't work if you're turning off your audience. And we keep trying things, and we turn off our audience, and we try something else, and we turn off our audience, and we find something that works. And that's the way that NCSF has been working at it. We figure it's better to try something and make the effort, get the feedback, and move forward and change. Um, because everybody needs to be the audience when it comes to consent education. Um, and I, like I said, I know from my work with the incident reporting <coughs> that all different types of people come to us for help. It's the largest category we have in our incident reporting response. It used to be discrimination. It used to be people being attacked um, on the streets. Um, child custody was a huge problem. And now what we're doing, we're helping people report sexual assault. Um, and we're cooking them up with victim advocacy services so that they can do that. Um, and get the help that they need so they don't feel like they're alone. I mean, that's the worst problem is if something like this happens, you're alone. You feel like you're alone. So that's why we teach people about consent, about setting your own boundaries, um, about choosing your own limits. And we want it to become routine that once you choose your own limits and you're comfortable with that, you also are respecting other people's limits. You're asking because you don't want to accidentally step over their boundaries. You're aware of your own and you're respecting theirs. Um, and that's what I see with the kink community. Um, I, I love it because these ordinary people, all these people here at the center, are giving back because there's a need. Uh, we're all volunteers. You know, we're not getting paid to do this, but there's an absolute desperate need for sex education. So when people come into the kink community, they're amazed that there's these people here that are encouraging them to talk about sex, talk about their bodies, and that sense of wonder, I love it. Um, that they're discovering how to talk about their bodies and how to talk about their sexuality because they're really not taught that. Um, that's why this adult education is so important. So, for example, I actually just read somewhere, 
some magazine, that couples that talk about poop are the happiest. But it's true because you're talking to your partner about your bodily functions and you know you're both on the same page about what's happening and you know it creates an intimacy. It creates an intimacy. When somebody accepts that in you like you accept it in yourself, you can trust that person. So um, that's why we have such a wonderful kink community in, in those terms, because we're talking about these very, you know, frank sexual things with each other, and we're finding acceptance. And we would love to see that go into the mainstream society. The next one. So we kinksters have a lot of practice about talking about consent. Um, in the best cases, we are masters at getting ongoing affirmative consent. Uh, in the worst, people mouth our slogans um, without any idea uh, of wanting to be consensual. Um, we attract predators, unfortunately, because uh, so many of us are closeted and um, because it's less likely that we'll report an assault or a sexual assault. And so um, some people come in and they prey on us. But um, that's why we have to inform everyone um, how to take control of their own sexuality, how to be aware of the red flags when you see them. Um, we're having wonderful education going on on um, groups and online and set life. There's certain people that are providing this education. We're trying to get it more out there. That communication is what's important, that um, you have to talk about what kind of experience you want together before you have it. And this is what mainstream society is resisting right now. This idea that you're going to negotiate sex beforehand seems so alien to them. Um, and to us, we're like, well, of course, it, it, it doesn't kill the vibe. It increases the anticipation. Um, it doesn't, uh, it isn't awkward. It's, it's actually how you reach that level of intimacy. And if it is awkward, isn't it better to be awkward with your words than with your body? You know? So we should be awkward together with our words and find our way with our words first and then, um, you know, open up our bodies as well to that. Um, because, you know, there's all sex entails some kind of risk, whether it involves kink or not. It's just much more obvious in kink. Because there is a mental, uh, physical, and emotional risk when you open yourself up to somebody, um, especially if they're misrepresenting who they are or what they're, what they're trying to get out of us. Okay, the next one. There's tons of resources to pull from. We have our um, consent and negotiation brochures over there. Um, and we like the who, what, where, when, why, and how. How to help keep you aware of the things to, to, to talk about in your negotiation. Uh, you know, who's going to be involved? Where is it OK to touch and not touch? I mean, that's a really important one. Because you can't just say, I'm not into having sex. Because for some people, sex is completely different than what you're thinking. You need to be specific. Where can you touch? If you can't touch the genital area, then don't touch the genital area. You know, with anything. You know, whether it's your fingers or your penis or a dildo, you don't touch. Um, these are like the latest iteration in facts that have gone back decades. Um, the, um, the first one I was involved with was the um, SM versus abuse policy statement from 1997, the Leather Leadership Conference. And that was built on <coughs> other uh, BDSM or SM versus abuse. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time in the BDSM community. But when I try to explain it outside the BDSM community, because I go out and I talk to a, a lot of vanilla um, mainstream people, uh, I try to explain that it's ready, willing, and able. That's what consent is. You're ready. You're standing on the starting line. You know the race you're going to run. You're ready. Right? You're willing. That doesn't necessarily mean you've got, like, you can have enthusiastic, yes, I'm ready to run this race. Or you could be, yes, I am ready to run this race. You know, grim determination <coughs> can, can, can accomplish wonders. I mean, if you've ever seen a book pull, like, like the Southwest Leather Conference, there are people that go in there and just are like, mm, I'm going to do this. And they do it and they have an amazing experience. So we can't dictate what people feel, but they have to be willing. Um, and then they have to be able. They have to be of sound mind. They can't be having an issue where it's clouding their judgment. And we have to give people room 
to have those times where, okay, we're not going to do this right now because I want you to be in a better headspace than you're in right now. So the question is, one of the questions we can think about is, how do we explain <coughs> consent in our own communities in a way that makes it easier to understand and easier for people to implement it in their own sex lives? Okay. One of the things we're going to talk about is affirmative consent in college campuses. Um, yes Means Yes has been active for the past five years, uh, since April 2011, was the Dear Colleague letter that set this whole thing off. It was the Office for Civil Rights. Um, and they told all of the universities and colleges that Title IX guarantees that all students should be able to get an education without fear of sexual harassment or sexual violence. And this set off what we have today, um, five years later. They talked about the epidemic of um, sexual violence on campuses. And that's things like rape chance, which, um, you know, fraternities, um, the uh, Delta Kappa Epsilon chant, no means yes and yes means no. <coughs> that was the original one in 2011. They got suspended for five years. But it's still going on. Even last year, it was uh, Sigma Nu fraternity was caught chanting rape in a video. And they were um, suspended as well. So even despite all this education that's going on, it still is happening. And it's not just the students. Um, we got the news out of uh, from California Berkeley that um, Claude Steele, the executive vice chancellor and the provo of the university, has resigned because two of his professors were found to be guilty by the university of committing sexual harassment against their executive assistant or student, and nothing happened to them. They were able to keep their jobs. So this kind of hit the media, and everybody's just like, are you kidding me? You're letting these professors who, who sexually harass all stay on campus? And they have both resigned, since resigned. So the, the pressure, public pressure, is forcing people to do the right thing. So um, one of the biggest projects, next one, is um, the Affirmative Consent Policy Project. They have a listing of 500 campuses um, and their version of consent and yes means yes policy. They carry on their RSS feed every day reports of violence on campuses. So if you want to keep track of what's happening, you can go to this RSS feed and just see the different articles um, and notices. And I've been tracking this because I've been getting ready for this. And I'm just appalled. Um, I had no idea there was that much happening. It's a constant issue that um, these colleges are fighting and battling. So affirmative consent, just to let you all know because there's you know, controversy about what affirmative consent actually is. But according to the affirmative consent policy, it's knowing, voluntary, and a mutual decision among all the participants to engage in a sexual activity. And consent can be by words or actions, as long as those words or actions create clear permission to continue. So, but because of the flaws in how some schools are handling these claims, at least 75 people have sued their claims since 2013. So, um, that's a problem because, uh, oh, great, thank you. Um, it's, they go by the preponderance of evidence. <coughs> Different in civil court versus criminal court. In civil court is the preponderance of evidence. If you think it's more likely than <coughs> not that a sexual assault occurred, the person's guilty. In criminal court, you have to have beyond a reasonable <coughs> doubt that something happened. And it's why O.J. Simpson was not convicted in a criminal court, but he was convicted or found culpable in a civil court because there's different standards that apply. So the colleges are going by the preponderance of evidence standard. But the problem is, is that this is just worlds away from the criminal justice system that NPSF deals with. I mean, we go to um, the police with people who have photographs of the injuries that they suffered. They have witnesses to the negotiations, witnesses to the abuse. They have medical testimony, medical reports. And um, we can often not even get an investigator to look into these cases, much less get a prosecutor to hear it. Um, and that's because a number of prosecutors have told us that we can't explain that somebody consented to a spanking, but they didn't consent to being hit in the face. We, can, we can't say that they consented to being caned on their butt, but they didn't consent to being caned on the back of their legs or their feet as they crawled away. Um, and that's a problem for us because we know 
you don't just say yes and anything goes. You say yes to certain things. And if our legal system's not backing us up in that, we have a problem. So that's why NCSF is working so hard to educate um, victim services so they can educate uh, law enforcement. So, and that's also one reason why we're working with the American Law Institute. And you'll hear more about this this afternoon from um, Judy Guerin and Dick Cunningham, who are both NCSF staff. Because the American Law Institute is trying to revise the model penal code on sexual assault right now. And they want to put affirmative consent into this, the model penal code. And so they're love talking to us because we tell them how affirmative consent actually works. We have a population of people that have been doing it for decades. And so we can tell them what are some issues that they need to consider, and hopefully we will get all that in there. Um, but Judy and Dick will talk about that later. So these rules with affirmative consent work to make it easier to um, to uh, attack somebody or you know convict them. They were made it to get us all on the same page, to know that you have to talk about things and empower each person um, before you have sex. So now I want to go through a few of the consent projects that have just popped up. Uh, the first one is um, Planned Parenthood. It's a great one. They have a series of videos. If you ever want to give somebody a video about consent, Planned Parenthood has been doing this for years. So they have a lot of experience with it. And they really um, show you that it can be very simple and sexy to get consent. Very easy. Uh, the next one, speaking of consent, is sexy. This is one that's kind of... Um, really popular in college campuses and there's been kind of a blowback. There's real criticism over it because some people say it's not sexy, it's mandatory, it's necessary. And so kind of more grassroots campaigns have sprung up at colleges that are using this around what consent really is. And we've got the two boards, the blackboards over there. Feel free to write what you think consent is and what you think means no. And we're going to um, take those and take pictures of them and put them up on NCSF later. Another one was... Um, <laughs> and this was Columbia University's last August. They launched it for their, you know, incoming students. And um, it was intended to reach a diverse population, but that diverse population kind of rejected it. Uh, it said it trivializes consent and um, appropriates African American vernacular in English. And then the next one. This is an emoji campaign. I like this one because it's actually images rather than text. Um, so they put these giant decals all over the University of British Columbia um, last September. And But again, some people were saying, well, it's kind of vague. It's, um, it's not so good. The next one is cosplay. Cosplay is people who dress up in costumes at science fiction conventions. And um, the cosplay doesn't equal consent is a really popular campaign that went over really well. It did a lot of education. Um, and it first uh, onto the internet as a meme in 2013, just a few years ago. And they were asking that um, they not be harassed because of what they were wearing. And they asked for rape jokes and jokes that marginalized people to be stopped. And they said, you have to be respectful of people's bodies and clothes. Um, so we'll hear more about this at the Consent Project. We have Mercy Stackhouse here, who's going to talk a little bit about that. And I know Kitty also has some experience in that. But one of the most successful ones is uh, a cup of tea. <laughs> Everybody likes a cup of tea because it's so clear. You ask, you want a cup of tea? It's like, what kind of tea? It's your first question when somebody says, you know, yeah, sure, I'll have a cup. What kind of tea do you want? Do you want it hot? Do you want it cold? Do you want milk? Do you want sugar? Do you want lemon? You wanted a cup, you wanted to go. <laughs> um, so why do we ask about tea? And ask all these questions about tea, but we don't ask questions when it comes to sex. I think it makes it very clear. <laughs> it, 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 sex is so much more important than a cup of tea. We should at least ask a few questions around it. Um, we also have the White House, the next one. This is the White House's It's On Us campaign. And I like this campaign because it puts it back on us to do something to be aware of dangerous situations, to intervene when you see or suspect that something's happening. And the pledge is basically to identify situations in which sexual assault may be occurring and to intervene and create an environment that makes, um, where sexual assault is unacceptable. And um, the next one, YMCA. This is happening right here in our backyards in Seattle. This is this Friday, 
Um, it's the Restorative Justice, it's the sixth annual panel on uh, Stand Against Racism, Restorative Justice. It's from 11.30 to 1.30 and it's free. And Fania Davis is going to be the keynote speaker. And I think this is very interesting because restorative justice has a lot of very useful applications um, uh, with you know, families, with communities in the workplace. Um, and we've seen it work with mass social justice uh, conflict. Um, but in the BDSM community, um, what NCSF has been doing is we've been encouraging people who want to reconcile to actually go to a professional mediator. We have kink aware professional mediators on our kink aware list because we're seeing some groups try to do restorative justice themselves and they may not have the training that it takes to be able to do that. It, it kind of recalls those old family courts <coughs> where you're forcing people to come together and you're forcing them to reconcile for the good of the group. And that's not for the good of the person who was violated. So you have to be very careful when applying restorative justice within a group. I think any time a group is doing something, the people who are in charge of that group, they have their group in mind first. I mean, I think there's a few groups out there that I would really back, Yandi, with her group in New York City. She has the training, she's a lawyer, she can do a restorative justice type thing. But I think for, the, for in general, we need to be careful of, of encouraging that. But from these projects, I think we need to think about what does consent look like in real life? How can we better reflect that? And to finish, I just want to talk a little bit about what NCSF is doing with consent counts and around um, consent. Um, <coughs> you can go to the next one. Um, consent counts started in 2006 to decriminalize BDSM. We wanted consent to be taken into account if somebody was charged with a sexual assault or assault. But we quickly realized we, need, we didn't quite really know what we meant by consent. Everybody was talking about it in the BDSM community, safe data, consensual, risk-aware, consensual kink. But really, what did consent mean? So we ended up doing um, plenaries on consent. We created our consent statement. We created our power exchange statement. We vetted it through the community. We did surveys. We did two surveys, first on attitudes on consent, and then on actual sexual violations in the community. Um, we also created a number of facts that <coughs> groups and individuals deal with consent violations. Last year we helped 26 kink groups deal with consent violations. Some of them were preemptively trying to prepare in case there was a consent violation, and in others there was a consent violation, and they wanted to make sure that they dealt with this in the best way possible, and that the people involved were referred to the services that they needed. Um, and that's what NCSF helps with. And we're also, right now, NCSF is working on a trauma brochure because a lot of people don't understand trauma reactions. You can have really inappropriate, quote unquote, reactions sometimes when you've been traumatized. You can laugh, you can brush it off. Um, and what we feel we need to do is to educate everybody in the key community about these trauma reactions so that when somebody comes up and says, you know, I've been violated, we can all react in a way that supports them the most and helps us get to the to a culture where sexual violence is not accepted. Um, so we also offer advice to um, ad hoc communities like the Mid-Atlantic community. You may not know about that, but that's a list of 40 educational um, event leaders and group leaders, and they let each other know about people who have violated the rules and been suspended or banned. And they also vet educators with each other is a wonderful list. It's not a black list. It's just people informing each other. We've had this problem with this person so that other group organizers and leaders can know if there's a problem happening. I would love to see this happen all over the country, regional networks, where it's just a list. You just post if it's a problem, and other people can decide what they do with it. Um, I think this is critical because NCSF's consent violation survey, we found 29% of the 4,500 people who took the survey said that their pre-negotiated limits had been, been violated or their safe word had been violated. Now you can't extrapolate this out to the general key population. First of all, because it was called consent violation survey. So I think it was an opt-in thing. So you're gonna get more people who perhaps had consent violations, even though we tried to say we were trying to find out about false accusations and things like that. But you can look at the people who did report and see the patterns within who reported. Um, and one in five of those people, one in five said they were violated by a community leader in the King community, 
Um, I think this is a really serious issue that we all have to deal with and face. Um, for us to call our, our BDSM, Kink, Poly, Spanker, furry communities safe. Um, we need to make sure that our educators are not abusing their power. Um, we have to hold them accounter, accountable. And so if a presenter has been accused of multiple consent violations, NCSF won't present at that conference, and we won't present at that venue. Um, we cannot present our consent counts um, discussions at the same place where somebody who actively is violating people is presenting. Um, that's the stand we're taking uh, because we think it's the right thing to do. We don't care how skilled somebody is. They could be the best in the world at what they do. But for us, the most important thing when it comes to BDSM is consent. And so we feel that we have to set, set the standard there. And that's why um, we think an important part of sexual freedom is standing up, um, saying something when we see sexual violence or harassment, helping people when we see sexual violence or harassment. Um, and we're committed to education and services that directly assist these people who've been hurt. Um, and NCSF is going to continue to work with kink and poly groups, as well as mainstream services, to educate about consent and BDSM. So I hope that you get a lot out of this consent summit. I've gotten a lot out of just organizing it and talking to people and bringing this all together. Um, I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say and what all of the presenters have to say about consent. Um, thank you so much for coming and let's make this a great event.